What stood out to you the most about this docuseries? Well, number one, uh, what he said about wanting to come back for a seventh ring, he thought that they would win it. Um, that would have been interesting to see. Number two, how Reinstorf got off the hook in terms of being casted hmm. as the ultimate villain. A lot of people pointed to Jerry Krause when it was really Reinstorf. Uh, you know, he definitely had his hands in that cookie jar. But the thing for me that stood out above all else is the era in which Jordan played and the things that he had to endure on his path to success. When we see these guys in the modern day era, it's not to say they don't work hard. It's certainly not to say that they're ultra talented and things of that nature but when I see that the road the road that they had to travel and I compared that to what Jordan had to endure in route to capturing his first championship and ultimately completing his sixth uh, to me it's just night and day in terms of what he had to endure compared to what the modern day players have to endure because of the rule changes that the NBA had implemented and things of that nature, the physicality of the bad boy Detroit Pistons then followed up by Pat Riley's New York Knicks with Oakley and Anthony Mason and Xavier McDaniel before that and all of that other stuff. I just think about that road and those battles, those wars uh, that Jordan had to endure. And to me, it just cements uh, in my mind, the fact that he is indeed the greatest of all time, and as far as I'm concerned, it's not even an argument. Yeah, Michael Jordan's the greatest of all time, um, certainly at his peak. The thing that jumped out to me, honestly, and I, I just, like, give way to hierarchical thinking. You know, I know there's the human drama and everything, but it's just pretty obvious to me Jordan would have won 10 championships if he never would have gone into baseball and had, had, had Reinsdorf, who's really, Stephen A., you're right, that's... He's, he revealed himself as the villain by the end because he admitted that um, the economics didn't make sense. They wouldn't have been able to keep it together. Nonsense. Of course you could have kept it together. They decided not to. He was playing it cheap. Reinsdorf had that reputation in baseball also. Um, but the 10 championships, look, the Rockets don't get those if, if Jordan stays. They barely got by the Knicks in 94. When I say barely, I don't just mean that it went to a game seven. In game six, John Starks took a three to win it. Olajuwon got his fingertips on the ball, sending it to a game seven. I mean, they very nearly lost to the Knicks. The Bulls would have beaten them uh, both seasons. And then the Bulls had at least were going to, especially as Michael Wilbon points out, in a strike-shortened season or a lockout-shortened season, that gives an older team that needs rest an advantage, in fact. And then I also point out that Scottie Pippen, the year after the strike-shortened season, which would be two years after Jordan left, for the final time, the Bulls. In that season, Portland gave the Lakers everything they could want. Took them seven games. The Lakers won the championship that year. You mean to tell, and that was Scottie Pippen, Portland. You mean to tell me Scottie Pippen with Michael Jordan and whoever else they would have brought in to put around him, because Robin was done by then with Ku coach and everybody, doesn't get one more game than Portland did against the Lakers. But but guys, even if you if you say no, they would have lost this one, they would have lost that one, even a cynic would say they'd win at least eight out of ten years. I mean, we're just never gonna see something like that again. The other thing that jumped out, Jay, and, and I think about you from time to time when I think about um, KD and how my perception of him has changed. You know when KD goes on everyone, goes at everyone on social media and it's a sign of insecurity and all this? Mm -hmm. And, Jay, you turned my I head around it. a little bit about this. To me, KD is simply treating people on social media the way he would treat someone with a giant media platform. In other words, he's relating to everyone as a person, not a better or worse, just a person. There's something I like about that. Jordan, the way he went at Scott Burrell and everyone is talking about, oh, he's a bully, he goes Steve Kerr. How is that different than the way he would go at anybody? Jordan treated all competition. <laughs> With another person as, I'm a man, you're a man, who's better? In a, in, a, in, a, in a way, I don't think of it as, oh, he was a bully. I think of it as, in fact, he respects the competition and, in fact, is respecting the other person just as though they're a superstar. Because as, as you're watching the doc, you're like, damn, Mike, really? You need to get yourself pumped up by beating up on that guy? But there was no difference between that guy to him and Larry Bird or Magic Johnson. He gave him all the business. Max, I'm with you. It was each and every second of the day finding something that got him to that extra level of that next space mentally. And, that, you know, he, he gave this great analogy of, you know, putting wood on the fire. That's what he looked for every single day to push him to get to that next level. There are two things that stood out to me about this documentary. Number one, this is the best documentary I've ever, sports documentary I've ever seen. 
I really give a lot of credit to ESPN and to Disney and to Netflix and to Brand Jordan, Jason Hare, uh, the executive producer for putting this whole thing together. Um, you know, this whole thing was was next level. And I've seen some great sports documentaries uh, from Hoop Dreams to Icarus. This one rated the best to me. And secondly, it just wasn't about the, the basketball accolades and could he have won, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, I think we all think he could. But it was the, the layers of depth, Stephen A., and you and I often talk about this when we talk about hoops, man. Like, you know, I've been through some serious things in my life and watching how he, like basketball to me was a safe haven. When I stepped my foot across those lines, it's like I, I felt lost in that in the game. I was one with the game and, and watching Michael Jordan through what he dealt with with his dad, through what he dealt with, with the fame that came along with it, uh, the amount of attention where he never felt like he could be, do normal things that other people could do, through even his guy Gus, that you saw that great relationship at the end, uh, the guy that was his security at the Chicago, the United Center, like watching him go through That's all like, those different yes. things. Um, but yeah, and the fact that he was able to stay in the moment and enjoy the moments throughout those things with the ride, Stephen A. And Max, like that, that's what blew my mind away. That that level of of focus and how you know myopic he could be on the goal and and, and keep all that in perspective. Uh, it just provided layers and depths that I, I I thought I knew a little bit uh, with the similarities of the the journeys to a degree, but I had no clue, no clue. Well, for me, for me personally, Jay, I don't, I don't, I don't have any aversion whatsoever to your your take and Max's take on this particular matter. I respect where y'all are coming from because obviously there's a lot of life lessons to peel uh, from what Michael Jordan, you know, talked about in this docu series and how motivational it can be. But for me, I'm thinking purely from a basketball standpoint because I'm covering this league. I've been. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.